I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be talking about the wonderful film Catching Dust with actor Aaron Moriarty and writer, director, and producer Stuart Gatt. And Stuart, I wanted to start with you and talking about the way that you've described your interest in telling this story and that you had a real interest in someone who was trying to understand their place in the world while being so isolated from it, because this is such an extremity in terms of the isolation that you have this central character based in. And I was curious in how that really set up a lot of the exploration for Gina and the structure of the story for you. It's really interesting that a London boy and a New York City girl yeah. ended up in this situation. This keeps coming up, and I think it's a fascinating thing yeah. that I've not reflected on. But I, think, um, no, I, think, I think it's also interesting as well because of the paradox it creates, or, or I suppose the analogs it creates with mm. the modern world where we, we feel so connected right now. You know, everyone's connected to everyone, but we're so disconnected mm. as a humanity. You know, it's like kind of crazy. I felt like there was something interesting about that idea that you, that, you know, the Gina character is filled with so much passion and ambition and isn't able to explore or understand it. She understands that she has talent, but she isn't able to place it in the world, right? Mm. And um, I thought it was interesting to create this idea where normally we see these kind of stories where it's like, okay, we have this character with ambition, we watch them go on this journey and they're, you know, going on their travels, whatever. I thought it was kind of interesting to create this idea that the world almost comes to, to them, mm. right? Um, but we're, and we're able to preserve that isolation. So it's like this vacuum effect. And I think that it was, it was a, an interesting way to kind of concentrate those themes and intensify them. So it was really a, a device to do that. It's, it's, it's not easy to do as a writer because it doesn't give you the same flexibility that you would have to cut to a million different locations. But actually there was a process, I think, there was a point during the process of writing where I was like, actually this is in a way easier or more interesting to, to get into the granular level of, of the nuance of someone's mm. personality, humanity, their, mm. their fears, their desires, and so on. And, and Erin mm. captured that so brilliantly with Gina. I love yeah, that description. Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say it makes it more intimate. And I come from the theatre world, so I just mm. love, I love it when anything reminds me of place because it feels inherently more intimate the less characters there are present in the story. Absolutely. Especially one like this. Yeah, of course. Erin, I also wanted to ask you about some of the work that you did with Jerome Butler, who was the dialect coach that you worked with. Oh, yes. Jerome, your prep. So nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that the two of you really got very specific about oh Gina God, and not just a Texas <laughs> dialect, but where in Texas is she from? Yes, yes. Um, so and you, yeah. 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 You said that like that. Up. Thank you. Of course. Well, I wanted to ask you about it because you've said that it really opened up the way that you kind of felt like you were able to inhabit and step into this character because it wasn't mm -hmm. just the dialect that you worked with him mm -hmm. on and it was all of those other details that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I was interested mm -hmm. in how that really created a different space of finding a character for you. Uh, it was it was like a hack into the character. It was a harder hack. It was really challenging. And I was scared because, you know, like I admire all my friends who aren't... Um, acting majority of the time in their native accent for me I feel like the accent is so important and I just like it's like any other part of the character but first and foremost it's like the way I communicate comes through and with the accent and so the way I communicate is contingent upon my ability to get it absolutely perfectly so I went to Jerome and I said I need this to be perfect and he and we just committed to it because also I knew that it would help me step into the role it's like when you play a character that's not like yourself and you put on an outfit and it's like an outfit that just like doesn't feel like you it's a part of your process of getting into that character and embodying them and embodying a character is way harder actually than then saying the lines or changing your voice or like those little things. It's the physical and the, these little like detailed mannerisms that come forward with an accent with the way someone holds himself. So like at the start of the film, we were talking about how her physicality was different and we wanted to show it in a subtle way. And we don't want to shove it down people's throats, but we wanted to do it in a way that sort of like, we're aware of and therefore it helps me play the character so she's a bit more hunched in, at the start of the film which I thought was funny because I've had periods in the past where when I've been going through uncomfortable and protective stages of my life my, I'm a little bit you're hiding yourself right and then you kind of as she steps into herself 
her physicality changes. So the voice and the accent and the socioeconomic background that she comes from, it was such a fun thing to do. And then we chose a specific woman actually who um, we just listened to. He has a million different recordings based on different accents throughout, throughout the world. And we thought this feels right based on where she's from. And we that's why I would go to the go to um um Stuart constantly and say, how much money did her parents make? How what where did she come from? What type of education did she get? So the accent led to me asking questions that that just made it all the more um complex and nuanced of a process and it brought her to life. But it was so much fun. I loved it. I loved it when it became second nature. At first I was terrified. But those scary roles are always the most gratifying. So, um, but it was, it was really fun. I also appreciated the way for both of you that you were able to construct this story in a way that just allows the audience to build a lot of the backstory and the history of this relationship. The very first Mm -hmm. moment that we see Clyde place his hands on Gina and she says, you said you'd never Mm -hmm. do that again. We Mm -hmm. know the entire history of their relationship and everything that she's experienced within it. Um, And so I just wanted to ask both of you about taking those really small touch point details, but still giving the audience such a clear picture of the story and the characters Mm -hmm. that they're stepping into. I think, um, we live in a world, especially in American cinema, I don't mean to throw. No, 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 <laughs> I, I did before. I didn't, please, 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 please <clears throat> but like, so. In American cinema, generally, I guess, well, let's just say the more, you know, the biggest, you know, Hollywood stuff. It's not fair to say about American cinema. The bigger Hollywood stuff, not the indie world. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, not the indie world. Yeah. One could say that formula is present here in ways that it isn't. Yeah, there's a constant, you feel like there's a constant anxiety. Sometimes you've got spoofy, the audience, everything. But audiences are very, very intelligent. Yes. Very intelligent. Because also, humans are, uh, actually, it's funny because I watched a, a, an interview on Annie Leibovitz, the photographer, mm-hmm. and she said she doesn't like to use Photoshop. She said because audiences and people can see when it's being used. Yeah, yeah. But we're, we're not experts in Photoshop, but we are, we're experts in reality. Mm-hmm. So when we, we're very sensitive to, to seeing the subtle changes. And we're also experts in human nature, right? Yes. And so humans speak in a certain way. They don't spoon feed their inner mm-hmm. monologue every two seconds. So it's about giving the audience credit for their intelligence. But most mm-hmm. importantly, you have to give room for an audience to transpose their understanding of themselves and other people onto those characters. If you don't do that, the audience is just passive and sitting there. But when you give them the room to do that, they become engaged. Mm-hmm. An engaged audience becomes connected to the characters. And I think that um, that was really the goal of this, mm-hmm. is getting that balance right. And I think the actors understood that perfectly because they knew where the line was and they never tried to, to cross it. Mm-hmm. Did yeah, you no, find, Darren, that that... Please go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, did you find that what Stuart was describing actually allowed you to really focus on a more nuanced and intimate type of performance? Oh, 100%. Because, because honestly, it's like, my thing is that I don't, I don't want, I want to, st- I want to fill in the gaps as the story progresses, because that means that the characters that we have, observe in these films are going to be more complex and as i said before i don't want to play a character that you can just label from the get-go and i think that we really like to categorize we need to categorize we need to label it's a human necessity and the less we do it actually and we're learning that in a broader sense but cinematically i feel like we need to catch up to that um we we need to label things in a way cinematically that just make stories neater because i think that we don't like to associate love with with pain and mess and we don't like to associate you know like certain things with 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 certain things that cinematically have been previously defined as positive right so these moments that involve like i it's it's why you know people will talk about this and it's it's a cliche at this point that exposition as an actor is such a it's like we're all allergic to it because we want to inform you who we are based on how we behave and based on what's transpiring in a scene. And if there's excessive or unnecessary exposition, it, it um, I just feel like it's it, I'm out from the get go because, because humans aren't like that. And I just, I think we all just came together on this project and just wanted to play humans. 
I think that's such a great point about the nuance of the gray space in between. And and Stuart, mm -hmm. I was interested in some of the nuance in creating the character of Clyde, because I think you've done a really wonderful job in creating a character that we understand why he doesn't have the tools to communicate his feelings and his affection in the right way with the traumatic background that he comes from. But it also never excuses what he's done and mm -hmm. the actions that he exhibits throughout the film. And so how did you make sure that you were constantly striking mm -hmm. that balance of understanding but never excusing? Exactly. And that's a, good, a very good question. It's something that mm. I spoke a lot about with the producers. They're always nervous about the Clyde character, what he came across as one dimensional and people won't understand him. And I was always, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's, I was going to say, that I was gonna comment that one thing that we always understand as I think writers we try to is that as long as an audience can empathize, they, they and understand why someone's doing something, they can't hate them. They might completely disapprove of their behavior. And as you say, it's inexcusable, mm. but they understand them because we're all human. But the big, the big thing is mm. Jai. Yeah. Jai. Yeah. But he does yeah. that. Like he, like he, yeah. 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 He, 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 he done, he could not have played mm. this role. Yeah. Like Erin, uh, you know, when you look at, when I imagined what they could have been, these characters, they, she couldn't have made Gina more 3D and more colorful. And Jai could not have got that balance right. But we fed off of each other. That's mm. exactly what happened. But like, uh, yeah. And I do find that it's quite medicinal when you know these characters that do the wrong things and, and do things that are categorically like really, really pretty bad. But then you look at where they come from, what they've been through. And so often we look at people and we think, if I was in your position, I would do better. And that is a huge problem. And so I do think that it's so important to like, you know, it's we to show characters that break your heart, make you angry, and you can't, you vilify in some moments, and then you, you just want to, like, hug them in other moments, you know, it feels like it allows for more, listen, films are ways that we can kind of tell stories and perspectives to people who might not otherwise be open to, like, hearing those perspectives, and so I think that that character and the way Jai played it is an example of that. And and these are people who just, you know, no one has time to, so many people don't have time to read books that entail perspectives that are expanding. So I do think that at the risk of adding too much gravity to what we do, because I do think ultimately it's entertainment, there is an ability to use it as an opportunity to expand perspective. And that's kind of where compassion comes in. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Stuart, I also wanted to ask you about the way that you shot this film, because you were talking at the beginning mm -hmm. about there's almost a limitation to writing a story that all takes place in, in one location. But at the same mm -hmm. time, from a visual standpoint, you've really made it this central embodiment that tells us so much about who these characters are. And I love that you also filmed it in 35 millimeter because it looks so beautiful mm -hmm. on screen. Mm -hmm. And so I was just interested in how you really use the setting to enhance the story. I think that we, you know, we had a, an incredible DP, Aurelian Mara, who, um, who's French, yeah, and, and yeah. you know, he's, he's like part of the family now, but he, yes. um, we, we spoke a lot about the, the thing that I was always very aware of is that we're in one, effectively one location audience, because mm. audiences can very quickly switch off, and we had to find a way to keep them engaged. It's a play, it really yeah. is a play. It's, and the thing really, is, it's, like, yeah. it's like, how do you shoot a play and keep it visually interesting? So we, me, Aurelian mm. and I challenged ourselves to really, use every element of storytelling and filmmaking and framing, even down to the way we use 35 mil. A lot of people use 35 mil now. I always shoot on 35 mil, that's just a choice for me. Like a lot of people use 35 mil now and you see it in the, in the theater and it looks like digital because it's been mm. so overworked and overgraded. Um, so we wanted to bring back a lot of the character of 35 mil that you're kind of used to from the 70s and 80s by mm. capturing as much in the negative and then doing as much as we can with the visual storytelling. Mm to keep it visually interesting. And it's, it's it's a balance between trying to be too aesthetic and correct, oh, look at me as a director and a DP, look what we've done, and to try and find those choices that work for the story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're working on a limited budget, you don't have the ability to get everything that you want, but I think we knew where to focus, and I think we've done the best job we could in doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a, the, the visual storytelling helps these guys as well so much. Like mm -hmm. if you pick the right shot, and of like like we the, the shots of like Erin laying on the couch mm -hmm. is her eye, and then it's her mouth, mm -hmm. and then it's her just her laying there. 
it does more than a monologue. It, you know, so it's about trying to, you're, there's always that synergy between the way you film and the stuff that the actors are doing. And I think it's about trying to get that balance right. Yeah, Absolutely. it was it's a character driven film, and yet you introduced like the concept that the environment can be another character, yeah. which is cool. Erin, I also wanted to talk a little bit, kind of going back to some of what you were describing before with your character, because we're essentially watching Gina go through this journey of rediscovering and reestablishing and reframing her sense of self. And it's been suppressed for so long. And I feel like in your performance, you capture the idea that it's a really non-linear journey that she's going on. You know, even the moment where they have the water fight and she has a childlike expression, but then all of a sudden things just snap back really quickly for her. And so I was interested in how you really used Stuart's script and your discovery of this character mm. to constantly have this internal push and pull within her I mean honestly I feel like in general life is one foot forward two steps back right I feel like it's often the case and I think that we need to um embrace that otherwise we'll keep disappointing ourselves and I think we need to give ourselves grace and so of course she's in a situation that is so challenging that she deserves more grace than anyone she doesn't see herself as deserving of that but I think thing is I don't even think she's rediscovering herself I think she is discovering herself for the first time and I think that is as Stuart has alluded to with these their each character's childhood contributing to where they are now it's so often the case that you know we find a way to recreate our childhood circumstance and she has been suppressed and she's gone from one suppressor to another and and the the very reason why this current suppressor, Clyde, her husband, is is her suppressor is because of his love for her. So that's what makes that side of their love so complicated and so heartbreaking. But with her, I feel like it's just um, I feel like this nonlinear journey, this 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 very and also not neat journey. Like the ending, it doesn't end in a neat way. It doesn't end with her necessarily being happy, but it ends in a way that allows us to at least see that if you trust yourself and finally step into your self worth, there is a possibility for what you want, right? It doesn't end in a way that feels too neat, which I think is really important. And the story is not neat and it's messy. And that moment that she has in the water fight, I think it's like she's experiencing this, this, this joy, this visceral like giddiness. And it's that's such a big moment for her because she thinks, no, 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 I'm not so I I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. And I think that's been present in her since she was a child. So I think she's recreated her childhood circumstances with this this man. I think she loves him. I don't think it negates the love she has for him. But I think that um, it creates for a messy journey. And I think that all of this actually makes her, in my mind, way more brave than anyone, like than I would have to be to do anything. Because I grew up in a world where like, like I didn't have to go through what she did had to go through to find myself. She has to find herself in spite of every person who's ever loved her and been a prominent person in her life, telling her that she shouldn't be who she is. Right. So yeah, no, she discovers it. And I've only ever played characters, I think, who have rediscovered themselves. So that's what's interesting. Mm -hmm. She's I think she's finding out for the first time. And I think it's hard. I think it's heartbreaking as as positive as it is it's also heartbreaking because of pride and everything else so no I think it's such a great point that journey of establishing for the first time and I, I love all the details that you both shared so thank you so much for talking about yeah. the film and congratulations on the movie thank, thank you, you so, so much, much.